I don't remember the amount, but yeah. they sampled a couple of schools. Yeah. They still even went and uh, they uh, selected student, like certain students to be involved. But yeah. I don't remember the whole sampling number. So let's just say that that program works and has some positive outcomes. It's a fraction, I mean, it's a minuscule fraction of all of the kids in the United States. So what do you think is the, what do you think makes it difficult for us to propose educational, you know, national level educational um, programs that would mitigate some of the effects of negative mental health? Just the resources required to carry out. Money, you know, right? Money, yeah. yeah. Money, where, where, where does the government get its money to run stuff. Taxpayers. From taxes. Enough money right. into the education budget. So the money comes from taxes and the government decides what to do with it and we already have politicians saying we should cut taxes, right? We should cut taxes, cut including programs. cutting programs, right? So we're cutting programs and cutting taxes. So that is there. No, I'm not telling you, you know, you gotta vote. You love Trump, yeah. love Trump. If you love Hillary, love Hillary. You gotta do what you gotta do. But um, the general consensus is is that um, from the authors of your book is that in, uh, an unwell society um, is going to worry primarily about you know lowering individual taxes and less about the kind of social services that may mitigate some of the effects of um, that some of these structural effects that impact negatively on mental health. Now. I think using the educational system is a good point to go to the second thing that they raised. Because how do we fund our schools? So let's say we, we have these great educational programs and we want to start them as early as elementary school. And we want to do it all around the country. But how do we fund our public schools? Well, public schools, that comes from the government, but then you have private schools, which is a whole other sure, source sure, of funding. Sure, sure. But here's what's interesting. Let's think about this. In the United States, um, the federal government only funds a small percentage. I think it's somewhere about 14, 14 to 20 percent of our public schools. So the federal government funds, it, it's a minority of what schools need is funded by the federal government. So where does the funding for our schools come from? It comes from it, us. From, comes from the people that work and pay taxes. So, so, so the federal, so the federal government more than the government the, just administers it. The federal government and the state, at least in, definitely in Texas, the state and the federal government fund a small percentage of what your public school has to do, right? The federal and state government fund just a little bit of what your public school has to do. Where does the rest come? Where does the other 85% come? Donations? Or no. whatever uh, hmm? Your neighborhood taxes? Your local property taxes, yeah. right? So the, the, the major basis of funding your school, like your private school in your neighborhood, comes from your local property taxes. So here's the thing. If you happen to live in Rogers Ranch, and I lived in Rogers Ranch for many years, where our taxes were thousands of thousands, taxes were thousands of dollars a month, right? Ta a month, we were paying thousands in taxes, right? So if you have a neighborhood, so property taxes come from the price of what? The houses, right? So if you live in a neighborhood where the houses cost a million bucks, your property taxes are super high, all that money, not all that money, but you have a much bigger base of resources to fund your public schools, right? If you live in a shit neighborhood where the average cost of a home is $125,000, right? Or you rent. Or there's lots of renters that don't even count into the formula practically. You have lots of renters. You have average price of homes, $125,000, $150,000. What do you think your, your, your property value tax base is gonna to be to fund your schools? Tiny. Tiny, right? Because in the United States, we fund our schools largely at the local level, at the neighborhood level. We don't, now, in San Antonio, there have been lawsuits against this, right? There have been lawsuits in San Antonio to try to spread the wealth so that some of the money, tax base from the Dominion, can go to the San Antonio Independent School District. And they lose every time. Yeah, but. Like in, I don't know if they have your 
the few people in this cohort that have been like working with the school district, so they would know, but they're not here, I guess, right now. But in California, well, when I in, when I lived in San Diego, they have these voucher systems Absolutely. where you could get a voucher from the school district to send your kid to a different school. Yep. I guess if he's making good grades and stuff, with the rationale being this, the school in his in this district sucks. Yep. So I want him to go to a better school. Yep. So you could work it so he. But then you have to get the transportation. That's exactly yourself. correct. The only That's problem. The trick is that often bus. when you use when they use the voucher system, <clears throat> they'll say, "Yeah, you can apply to go you to whatever get school you want, but you got to get your kid there." Yeah. We're not going to send a bus all the way across town to get your kid. And who tends to be able to drive their kids wherever they want? People with money. You know, two parent homes, right? Where one potentially stays home or works part time, they can drive so kids it's around. Like a solution that's not really a solution. Uh, it looks like one on paper, though. Um, correct. Which leads to the second point that they make. Um, besides being an unwell society, they make the argument that the United States is an unfair society, right? That the United States is unfair society, which is to make the case that it's not like we lack all of these potential resources and that we don't lack the possibility to mitigate against negative mental health. It's just that those resources are split unevenly. Right? The, the haves have the resources to deal with mental health issues, but for large segments of the American population, they lack the types of resources. So if we backtrack this whole thing, an unfair society would, would be a society characterized by low income sectors of our, our communities in our society that lack good food, right? Good healthy food, that lack uh, that are immersed in negative, detrimental environmental areas, right? That lack access to health care, that lack access to mental health care. That would characterize an unequal society. And so when we think about, um, again, about public policy, being a very controversial piece of legislation, I understand it. But that is the whole point of the uh, Affordable Care Act, the ACA, what is commonly referred to as Obamacare, Obamacare right? Uh, what is, uh, what it, if nothing else is an attempt, the idea of, not just in the United States, but around the world, the idea of universal health care access is to move away, and clearly the authors of this book are pushing for it, uh, is to move away from a model of an unwell, unfair society. Because what universal healthcare does is regardless of your community, regardless of your neighborhood, regardless of where you live, everyone has access to the types of resources that would mitigate against these processes which negatively impact mental health. So that's really what we're gonna try to address um, amongst ourselves as a group um, in this book and for the students who are going to be listening to this and hearing your remarks uh, week to week. Um, any closing comments before we wrap it up? Anything well, else? Care, sorry, the ACA has the flaw. I I don't know, This I should throw this out here. I'll probably get torn apart. But has the flaw, too, that the, the, the benefit of it, of trying to get the health care to the people that just can't afford it, that big majority of people that can't, the, and the um, the cost of it falls is still falls on like the the middle class people that can really least afford the extra bite out of the budget, and the people that could most afford to help the poorest people already weren't affected because they had their own Cadillac programs or whatever they call them that already had good health care and they're not re really even affected by it. It is not it's it's the the richest people aren't really chipping in anymore it's taking the biggest bite out of like the lower middle and middle working the i working think what you're saying is that the very wealthy have to pay more for those qualifying yeah. aca health care pro uh, i think program. what i think what you're saying is that the very wealthy are able to I'm still weaseling out yeah they can get out of the system they That's can get out they can pull out of the system um middle class people are unable to pull out of the system because their employers are like saying oh hell yeah i'm going to go with you know i'm going to go with the Affordable Care Act, therefore all my employees- Pushes the middle down, down lower, yeah. which is now, basically how 
third wolf like well that's getting way off topic well, so never mind no because this is at a minimum <clears throat> where public policy and public health intersect i would suggest that the, the at the end of the day we have no idea what the what the effects of the affordable care act we don't know why do you think i say that it hasn't been enough time it's just not enough time People right, that passed it even admit they didn't read all of it. They uh, need to read the that, whole thing. That's, that's politics. That's thing. politics. That's Fox Network. That's not what we do as social I scientists. I would just say it's Fox yeah, Network. That's, well, sure it is. That's the network that was primarily <laughs> okay. opposed to the Affordable I'll Care Act. We'll MSN, move on if you are. MSNBC and, and MSNBC and CNN, I, there's been media studies done left and right. Fox, Did minute it, by minute. Nancy was, Pelosi make a public statement that you got to pass it absolutely but that. but was, that, that's, Fox make I, that, 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 that that was a legitimate you know that's a legitimate point i take it there but the point is as social scientists that's not the garbage that we deal with right? i know that's, that's not that's not what that's not that we deal with in parallel not, you know, as much sh shut the fuck up would you geez give I me a break you said no <laughs> jesus christ as <laughs> as as social scientists that's just not the world we inhabit the world that we inhabit is to say, here's the public policy, here's the expected outcomes of the public policy, but it's gonna take a lag time. You do not, you know, in you do not tra essentially transform a made overhaul, like one of the most massive healthcare systems in the world, and assume that you're gonna know anything about that change in two or three years, right? What it's going to take, and it's not done, and we're not done. One thing I will tell you is it ain't going nowhere. They can talk all they want about change and revise. It ain't going nowhere. The United States will now, from right now to the present, to the future, have some form of universal health care available to all citizens. Right? It's going to happen. It's the here. It's already happening. What the specific outcomes of it are, we're not going to know for 10 years. And I'll give you a perfect example because... Before we close up, this is a way to think about it. Uh, when we do actual research on these macro level forces that impact millions of individuals in a population, it takes, uh, the lag time is so long to see the consistent effects. And the example that I would give you is the GI Bill, right? During World War II, for those students that may not be familiar, during World War II, uh, the United States government passed, I forgot the formal terminology, but what we now call the GI Bill, which allowed American soldiers, airmen, people who fought in the war, and women too, it gave them several things. Low interest loans, low interest home loans, low interest uh, aid to go to school, um, and low interest business loans to start businesses. All this for American GIs who would fight in Europe and the South Pacific and made it back. This allowed, and it passed with overwhelming congressional approval. That I will tell you. There was very little debate about should we pass the GI Bill. It passed overwhelming congressional approval. But we had no idea what the effect of the GI Bill was going to be. For years afterwards, they were saying, oh my God, this thing is not working. Nobody's using it. The GIs, after the war's over, now everybody starts complaining. The GIs aren't using it. It's too expensive. It, you know what was said about the GI Bill after the war? It is going to bankrupt the United States Treasury. The same thing they say about what? Social Security. Same thing they say about, the, well, recently about the Affordable Care Act, right? Oh, yeah, Obamacare. Yeah. Uh, the same thing they say about the Affordable Care Act, they were saying about the GI Bill. It's gonna bankrupt, nobody's using it, it's not working. And I'm sure they were well-meaning people, but they didn't give it enough of a lag time. Because now in retrospect, decades later, we know that the GI Bill was absolutely one of the most transformative pieces of American legislation ever passed. Probably since Thomas Jefferson bought Louisiana, or whatever, the Louisiana Purchase, right? Um, yeah. Large numbers of American, particularly men, and frankly, white men, uh, because the GI Bill was also racialized in its own way, but we don't need to get into that. In general... I just want to throw it out there. Yeah, 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 because that's a whole separate... That's, that's, like a, that's like a... Turn that off. 